Is there a strategy that'll help you grow your company faster? CEO Sales Strategies is an investigative business podcast for entrepreneurial people who never stop asking questions. Highly acclaimed sales revenue growth expert, Doug C. Brown, interviews CEOs, business owners, and professionals who serve them to uncover and share actionable tips and methods behind their bulletproof sales strategies. Topics covered on the show include their failures, struggles, secrets, and processes that help them succeed in selling millions to billions of dollars of their products and services, all with the sole aim of helping you grow your business. If you are eager to know the most effective sales secrets from the A players of the game, then the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast is certainly the place to be. Hey everyone, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. We're going to bring an interesting topic to you today from a man whose name is Sari Ibrahim, and he owns a company and it's called Financial Asset Protection. Now we're gonna talk about a way to kind of self-fund or self-finance, uh, kind of how to be your own bank in, in a way using a vehicle uh, for doing this. Uh, I know these vehicles have been around for a long time. I've talked to people who have used them uh, as well. And it's really kind of a cool concept because I mean, the reality is you either gotta pay interest out and you're gonna lose that interest or you can actually kind of pay yourself the interest. And this is, when I first heard this, it was such a foreign concept to me. And I don't mean foreign in a bad way. I mean, a foreign in a like, whoa, what is this type of process? Um, but it's, you know, backed up by life insurance basically. And the first introduction I really got to this was when I was helping a client who did uh, financial help, if you will, for, people trying to get into college. And what was happening is that the parents would have money in the bank or the kids would have money in the bank and that counted against them for getting financial aid in a big way. And so what these financial uh, folks would do, the financial advisors, if you will, they would move this from point A to a, uh, a life insurance type policy. And you know they couldn't do it last minute because that was just one situation that is not legal to really do but they could do it over a few year period prior to, and they moved these assets over into life insurance. And then when they ran the numbers, even though they had the money in life insurance, uh, it didn't count against them. And I was like, this is kind of a crazy thing. But um, so I started looking at this more and more and more and more. And the reason I uh, was grateful to have Sari on here is because he, he knows how to apply it toward the business world. And so we're gonna to talk to him about it. Uh, hopefully you'll find this interesting. Uh, this might be a bit controversial. It might mess with your mind a little bit, but uh, uh, keep open, if you will. Let's go talk to Sari now. Sari, welcome to the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. Thanks for being here. Hey, Doug. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. I, I, I really am interested in having this conversation because I know you and I talked a little before this, but I really love this concept of how do you think like a banker? right? Mm -hmm. In your own business, reinvesting your money back in to get the business to snowball, you know, and, you know, because how do you not work so hard in the, in the, <laughs> in the business world, right? There's a lot of people who own companies, uh, run companies who are listening to this. Uh, I really think that, you know, one of the, the, the top line things that I'm asked all the time is, you know, how do I get more leads and customers? And the second mm -hmm. one is how do I work smarter, not harder in my life? you know, uh, when it comes to the business. So let's talk about thinking like a banker and reinvesting back into the business yeah. side and really getting the business more from the, like the, the employed side into the systematic and or investor side of the business. Of course. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so my first question would be this, why do you think most people don't think like a banker <laughs> and that most yeah. people are building it on their back, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. It's because as entrepreneurs, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur myself and we get too focused on the subject matter. Like if you run a marketing company, that's all you know, marketing. That's what you're passionate about. If you run a law firm, if you run an accounting firm, whatever the case might be. Uh, one problem with that is we get too focused on the subject matter and we forget about the, the money aspect of the business, which is usually the goal, right? The, the goal for entrepreneurship usually is to own, like you mentioned, a system that generates you money. Now, the problem, though, is creating that system 
is different usually from the subject matter of your business, meaning that it's two separate parts of your business. You have your subject matter business, the type of industry it's in, and then you also have the uh, creating the system, kind of almost in a sense, firing yourself from certain duties and then outsourcing those or delegating those to other people within your team or out, out of your team. The point is you're not doing those tasks. And I think that's hard for a lot of entrepreneurs to let go of that, right? Especially if you've been doing it for years, you're really good at it. It's hard for you to give the wheel to somebody else. So I think that's, that's and that has a lot of, a lot to do with the next point of what is, what does it mean to think like a banker? So why do you think it's hard or why is it hard is a better question to. Yeah, because it usually when people start their businesses, right, there's like a two or three year dip where they make less money than when they were employed somewhere else. Or there's usually like a, almost a loss, even from a tax perspective of losing money. And uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like uh, commitments in place. So they've committed a lot. They put in a lot of hard work, a lot of money into their business now to give up the wheel for somebody else to do it. It's like, there's an ego thing there too, right? Like you're really good at it. You've been practicing, you've been honing your skill. And now for somebody else to do it, it's just kind of too much for a lot of entrepreneurs, which is a big reason why a lot of entrepreneurs don't grow. And it's also even, I guess, even a bigger problem as to not exiting the business. I think about 85 to 90% of businesses are not properly suitable for exit. Meaning that if somebody's going to come buy your business right now, because you're so heavily involved, in the day-to-day -day operations, that it's hard to it's hard for somebody to come by the business and replace you because without you, the business could uh, could suffer. So that's that's actually not a good thing. That, that you want you want it to be to the point where you have a sellable entity, where you have this, I guess, in essence, a money making machine that somebody else can purchase from you. And um, when you have it that way, the business is far more beneficial. So I guess we want to get to that point, right? We want to get to the point where we have this entity that makes money, and then you own that entity. So what about the people that say, you know, I never want to sell my business, but I, you know, I just, I'm, I'll be, you'll find me passed out in this chair, you know, behind my <laughs> desk at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I've talked to business owners like that and that's completely fine. I guess it, then it goes into the, the other points of it too, is that, you know, the other financial parts of it too, like expanding, right? If you, if you, if you wanted to expand, if you wanted to hire more, you know, hire more efficiently, market more efficiently, there's some there's some typical problems in the financial services world. Like for one, the amount of interest we pay to other people to use their money. I've done I've done this. We do this calculation where we we calculate the total amount of interest paid to mortgages, credit cards, business loans, and other types of loans. I've done this analysis hundreds of times, and on average, we come up with over a ten year period something like um two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in interest is spent in a ten year period on on average. So it's a big deal, right? A big part of our income as entrepreneurs and as as business owners from the business, it goes to interest, goes to servicing interest on all types of loans. So what if what if we could reposition that, right? Where we are the lenders in that situation, we are recouping that interest back into our pocket. Um, it changes everything, right? It changes the way we view our business and it changes the way we grow our business. So well, let's talk about that because you got yeah. my interest here. Okay. So <laughs> I, I currently have two bank loans uh -huh. right, on, on my companies. You know, one of them is in startup phase and it was a development company. So, you know, developing software. So yes. there was a, a heavy, and we did self-finance a lot of it, but we took some money on it. You know, let's talk about how do I bank my, my own and whether we use my example or somebody else's example, that's fine. And then, then I have a, a, another question for you right after you. I've, I've got a whole boatload of yeah. notes that I'm writing here. So how, how do I not pay the quarter million dollars in interest and what should I do? Because it sounds like, well, am, am I going to eat ramen noodles for the rest of my life type thing, you know, when I when I start thinking like that? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the, the first step is um, there's a concept called becoming your own banker. It's also stretched into the bank line yourself concept. So I am a bank line yourself professional. It's like an organization that helps uh, real estate investors and business owners become their own source of financing. It's using a specially designed type of whole life insurance. So there's typically there's typically two kinds in general of life insurance. There's like term life insurance, which is just the way it sounds exactly. It's, it's just a life insurance only. It's what most people think about when they think about life insurance. And then there's a permanent form of it that has cash value in it that grows, the cash value grows, you can borrow it. Now, Doug, a lot of people are like kind of surprised that, you know, I was talking about entrepreneurship, I was talking about interest, and now I'm talking about life insurance. What do those three things have in common? And 
I recommend you highly ch you check out the book, uh, The Bank on Yourself Revolution by Pamela Yellen. And the book talks about the strategy. We're using high, high cash value, whole life insurance to become your own source of financing. So you would get a, a life insurance policy designed specially for cash value, high cash value, and high cash value growth. And then you would put money into it and then borrow against that. And then when you borrow against that, you could use that to reinvest in your business or to pay down the other loans you have becoming your own source of financing. So in essence, you're like refinancing your loans through your whole life insurance policy and you become your own source of financing. The advantages of doing that are the benefits. Well, like why would somebody even want to do that? The benefits of doing that are number one, the growth of the policy is going to grow tax-free. Uh, in most situations, the loans are tax-free. The withdrawals are tax-free. You'll get a you'll get a growth in the policy about twenty times more than a traditional savings account, and it's a it's typically an asset protection plan. So there's a lot of like back end benefits to using cash value whole life insurance within your business and and having it fund your business and becoming your own source of finance financing. And most importantly, the interest you would otherwise pay to other lenders, you recoup that back into your pocket over time. So you become like a you you earn compound interest over time. We're speaking with Mr. Sari Ibrahim and uh, Financial Asset Protection is the name of the company. And I really wanted to bring this forth because this, this conversation when we first talked, because a lot of people don't think about this. And Sari, one time I was helping a company, um, well, done this many times, but one company in particular that I was helping, they were doing kids for college, right? They were, they were, they were helping kids get in, uh, afford the parents to afford to help the kids afford to get into like these prime schools. But when they had money in the bank and they had certain things in the bank, you know, it counted against them on getting financial help yes. from the government. So one of the vehicles that this company used was life insurance. And they moved their, they moved their assets out of the banks yeah. per se into life insurance policies. And they could still have access to these life insurance policies down the line. And it changed the financial ratio so that their children who couldn't get mm -hmm. college funding now could get college funding in the form of different ways. Some of it was free money. So it kind of reminds me of something similar to, to that. So, but I can imagine people going, whoa, 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 I'm going to take my money. I'm going to stick it into something I know nothing about yeah. and uh, risk, risk, you know, the alarms are going to go off. How safe are these type of things? Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm so happy, Doug, you mentioned that because that's actually one of our strategy, strategies. It's called the college funding strategy. And it's exactly how you mentioned it. We would get a whole life, we would we would move assets from certain uh, certain types of assets into whole life insurance. And the reason being is when you go to apply for certain things, it depends on the category, right? But one thing, like if when you're going through these financial asset reports for student loans and student financing and things like that, they ask about the parents' assets. And one of the excluded assets is whole life insurance. So, so that helps you reduce the uh, current um, asset size without actually literally reducing your net worth. Right. So that's really important. Right. It's actually a strategy. Now, how safe is it? So we work with typically three insurance companies and these insurance companies have been in business for like over 160 years. They've been in business for a really long time. They have a proven track record of paying out dividends. So that's one of the things when you have these whole life policies, you are a mutual owner of these insurance companies as a customer. You're a mutual owner of these co companies and you receive dividends on an annual basis. The dividends are not guaranteed, but again, we have a proven track record. These insurance companies have a proven track record of paying out dividends for over 160 years, even through the Great Depression, through the 2008 crash, through COVID, um, and, the, and they'll continue to do so. And in, in my opinion, they'll continue to do so. So we're talking about very strong, strong, high-rated insurance companies that are highly regulated. They have to have enough cash on hand to pay off life insurance, death benefits, to provide loans to their customers, to provide other financing financing resources. So these are very solvent companies. There was a book I wrote. Uh, I, re I read. It's called All About Annuities. And the author mentions he, he talks about the power of life insurance companies and and how strong they are. And he mentions that if you took all the life insurance companies in the U.S., there's about two thousand life insurance companies, and you took all their capital all the reserves and you pulled it together, it would be greater than all of the cash in the world from all the banks and oil companies combined. So to kind of give you relative comparison to how much cash um, life insurance companies are sitting on, they by far have the most cash. So we're talking about arguably the safest place on earth 
to to put your money in is um, a U.S. life insurance company because of how they're regulated and because of their 100 plus year track record. It makes sense. Now, I know I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble with this statement, but it, it's not crypto, right? <laughs> I, I can yeah. I can already see the hate emails and the hate mail kind of come through on that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're talking about a strategy that allows us to actually, it's a tax strategy, but it's also a funding strategy where we're not paying interest out to other entities. We're sort of paying the interest back to ourselves, if you will. Yes. And then I'm assuming, let's say I took one of these policies. Uh, when I die, mm -hmm. then that policy gets paid and it pays off all this debt. Is that how it works? Exactly. Yeah. So when you start off, when you start off with the policy, the life insurance is already so much more like just to kind of give you like, um, I can't really give you exact numbers, but let's just like an example. Somebody does a policy. It's going to be, you know, $10,000 a year. Year one, the life insurance might be half a million dollars on that person, depending on their age and the state they live in and other factors. But let's just say the, the life insurance might be half a million dollars. Right. Now, because we're starting with 10000 in premium and half a million in life insurance, we're already uh, the life insurance is already at a far greater start. And every year, the cash value that you can leverage and the life insurance are both going to grow every year. So the cash value will never catch up to the life insurance. It will always grow. Actually, I take that back. It will catch up. The, like, the cash value will keep growing to meet what the life insurance is at age 121. So that means if you did live until age 121, the cash value you have will meet the actual life insurance. But for the most part, the life insurance is always going to keep exceeding what the cash value is. So that means that if you had a life policy, you've been putting money into it, borrowing, putting money into it, borrowing, your debt reaches $800,000 with the insurance company, your life insurance could be, the death benefit could be $3 million. That means when you pass away, they take $3 million death benefit, they subtract the outstanding loan, $800,000, and they give the remaining $2.2 million to your beneficiaries. So you always come out ahead. You always come out ahead because the life insurance is, is, is at a far greater start than what the cash value is at. So my wife tells me I've got to live at minimum of 42 and a half more years. So... And, and so I'm still won't be at the 121, but the, uh, <laughs> so, so what I'm hearing is, cause I have life insurance now, right? Mm -hmm. So I have life mm -hmm. insurance. And, and so, but if I swung my life insurance over to a different type of life insurance, mm -hmm. I still would have life insurance. And I now can have something that I could borrow against that when I pass away, um, I don't have to worry about my family getting, you know, calls or whatever, because the life insurance just pays this thing off. I mean, it just seems so unreal that it's yeah. real. So, and I can hear people going, this makes sense, but yeah, you know, yeah, <laughs> it's too far to think about, right? It's too, it's too abstract. It's too not, um, like a uh, tangible, right? It's too intangible to think about. So that's, that's kind of the problem is right. With, with, with seeing it, it's, Okay, yeah, I, I live to a hundred. Yeah, I you know you know borrow you know a million dollars. I have four million dollars in life insurance. Yeah, but at the same time, like, how does it help my business today? That's right. the question, you know. <laughs> so 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 that's that's my next question. We're talking with Sari Abraham, and he owns a company called Financial Asset Protection. So that is my next question. How does it help my business today? Because you know, okay, great, I get it. I get older. We're all gonna go there. Don't yeah. want to go there, but we're all gonna go there. And uh, so that's done. I imagine my kids, grandchildren, great grandchildren, you know, uh, you know, great grampy had a, a $20 million policy. Uh, they're all going to have a, a sad little four minute party and then party like crazy. Cause that's what I'm going to ask them to do. Um, <laughs> and, and it'll be paid out of my life insurance. <laughs> so, so we know what's happening down the line, but how does it help me now? Like, you know, here we are today, all the inflation's happening, yeah. everything's going on. Uh, you know, money is thinner than it was 20 years ago, if you will, if you look at yeah. a dollar value versus today, 20 years ago, how does this help a, a business now? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So now I would start funding a policy, right? You could, I, I mean, I, I started my first policy with $300 a month. So it's nothing too crazy, right? You don't need to be a multimillionaire. You didn't, you don't need to tie up millions of dollars to do this. Um, so I would just start off with one policy, just pay in monthly. And then with these policies, the way they're designed, is month one, you put money into it, you could borrow against it. So that's exactly what I would do. I would put money into it month one, 
put money into borrow against it, use for other things, kind of get the cycle going, the snowball effect of going where anytime you put money into, into these types of policies and then you borrow against it, it keeps growing regardless of whether you took out a loan or not. I like to compare it to like real estate, for example. If you had, for example, a $500,000 property, and let's just say it had no mortgage on it, it was just paid up in cash, $500,000, that was the market value of that property. And then you go take out a loan from a third-party lender using the property as collateral. You take out a $100,000 loan. Does it shrink the market value of the property? It doesn't, right? It's just a loan against the property. The market value keeps growing, assuming mar assuming real estate values keep growing. The market value of the property is still going to grow even with that outstanding loan. And in a lot of situations in real estate, the, the market value of the property outpaces the, the cost of the capital. Right. That, that, that's also called arbitrage, right? So the amount of money you're borrowing on this side is growing. And then the amount of market value on your assets is growing. And the hope is that the market value of your assets outpaces the cost of the capital. This is the reason why the richest people in America will always borrow money. They're the biggest borrowers of money is because they're borrowing money from banks and then putting it into assets that grow in value, such as real estate, life insurance, and other assets that are constantly growing. And they borrow against those assets and the, the market value of those assets exceeds what the cost of the capital is. This is how billionaires think. This is how banks think, hedge funds. Um, they're, it's not that they're avoiding debt. And a lot of people kind of are confused with that. They're, they think that if I have to go borrow money from somebody, it means that I don't have the money and it means I'm in like a lower position. And I think the, the complete opposite is the truth, right? Banks are targeting people with money, with resources, with collateral to give them the money so that that way they could take that money and put it into assets and cash flow assets that are going to exceed the cost of the capital. That's the reality of the of the banking world. They're not trying to give money to people who need money to survive. They're trying to give money to people with software, intellectual property, real estate, houses they own, other assets they have that they can leverage and make more money with that money. It's almost like the bank is betting on you. And they, they see your idea, they see the collateral you already have, they see your credit score, they see all these things you've already done. And they say, you know, we can make a lot of money with this person. We'll give them the money and they'll make more money with the money that we're going to give them. Yeah. So that's kind of the yeah, reality. That, and, if, and if anybody doesn't believe that statement, go try to take a bank loan on something traditional yeah. and see what they put you through. And, you know, the reality is that even if you're in a great financial position, sometimes if your ratios are off on the business, even if you've got... You could have a million dollars in the bank yeah, and then want to go borrow a half million dollars. By the way, this is a true story, right? Yeah. Million dollars in the bank, want to borrow a half million, but you, you expense down your business so much that the bottom line is pretty meager on the bottom yeah. line. They won't give you the loan. The bank will not give, in many <laughs> cases, will not give the loan. Even though you can show them a million dollars in their bank. Yeah. They will not give you a loan unless it's it, it's secured with the million dollars or the, yeah. the, the half million, right? So what I'm hearing is, if I sound a little passionate, that is a story that happened to me. I mean, I literally like, look at your computer screen. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? So they want to secure your asset there in order to give you the money. However, if you have a idea like you're talking about and you have tangible assets yeah. that they can pull against, they'll give you money much easier yeah and and it it's like counterintuitive yes i have found to the human conditioning that we've all been brought up with to think like well like what we're talking about right that you yeah. could actually have a, an intangible that's actually appreciated exactly yeah and it brings us to my next point doug and that is that when any time you go take out these loans from the insurance company there is no underwriting at all the only thing the insurance company is looking at is how much cash value you have and then you could take out 90% of that. So a simple example, you have $10,000 in cash value. You go to the insurance company, you could borrow up to $9,000 in, in as a loan that you borrow against the policy. The policy keeps growing. And then now you pay back this loan whenever you want. It doesn't show up on your credit. There is no there is no credit rating with this. There's none, nothing. It's just a private loan between you and the insurance company. It's, there's, it's not public information. Nobody can look up this loan. So this becomes very powerful, right? Especially when you're, Number one, like how you said, like, what if you're a business owner? What if you have all these great ideas? You have a million dollars in cash, but you can't get you can't get the, the additional loan with this with this policy. You could skip all of that. You can go directly to the insurance company, whatever your cash value is at that time. You borrow 90 percent of it. You pay back whenever you want. You can pay back monthly. You can pay back daily. You can pay back annually. Whenever you want, you can pay back that loan and then recycle that process. 
that it helps in the situation where you're not able to get financing. It also helps in the situation where you are able to get financing, but you want more financing. For example, in real estate, right? You have a property that's $100,000. That's the, the cost of the property. You can get 80,000 against it right from the bank. The bank wants you to put $20,000 into the property. Well, right. that $20,000, you can go and borrow from your life policy. Even if you could tell the bank, the bank's going to ask you, where did you get this $20,000 from? You can say, I got it from my whole life insurance policy. The banks use whole life insurance. So they understand They'll, they'll take that as your own equity, not as a, not as leveraged money. You didn't borrow the money from somebody else. You you borrow that money from a life insurance company that has your whole life insurance policy. So they'll look at it as the same way as if you took twenty thousand dollars out of your bank account because they know that you're not on the hook. You're not on the hook financially, right? For that twenty thousand dollars, it's a non recourse loan. You're not held liable. If I went and I borrowed twenty thousand dollars from somebody else. That bank wouldn't like that because it's almost like they're bringing in another partner on that property. Right. The bank doesn't want that. The bank just wants me and them on the on the property only. They don't want unknown partners, unknown people. But when you're using whole life insurance alongside these other loans, it completely eliminates that problem. It's just you and the insurance company, It's which is you in essence. It's you. It's not additional creditors. There's no other recourse. So <laughs> I guess the only recourse is death. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. once, once you die, they get their money back regardless. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Now yeah. I wanted to bring this up because I, I know this is the subject matter might be a bit like people are thinking still sounds a little sketchy. It sounds a little out there, you know, um, but I happen to know a lot of uh, wealthy people who are using these type of mm -hmm. methodologies. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, one other thing I think that's a challenge for most business owners, especially like, let's go back to the startup phase. Yeah. You start a business up, you're building it, building it, building it, building it, building it. You're trying to survive and you're taking as much out to pay your bills and pay the company as possible. Like everything yeah. basically comes back and then goes out again. And you look at the thing at the end of the year and you go, okay, we survived this. We're at mm -hmm. our next level. Then we start building a little and we start building some more infrastructure into the business. We try to get, you know, other employees in and, uh, and do all of that. But I still think the mentality, because we've been trained mm -hmm. to try to keep it all. Yeah. That we are still thinking that way as entrepreneurs. And as we grow a business and I had to learn this the hard way because eventually you just get to a point where you can't grow anymore. Yeah. That, okay. Now, I'm not supposed to keep it all. I'm supposed to keep a part of it yes. as an owner. Now, if, if we think about that from the beginning, in the beginning, we would, we would immediately start going, okay, I need this asset and this asset and this asset. But, but we don't do that because we're like, how the hell do I even survive? I, how do I pay my bills, yep. right? So we, we habituate ourselves, I believe, to keeping it all. And as we start to grow, then what happens is we still have this, I got to keep it all mentality. So we don't go out and reach out to things like these vehicles that we're talking about, because we think, my God, if I give that away, then that's gone. But the reality is you're not supposed to have it all anyways. And, 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 yeah. and at the end of the game, death, if you will, yeah. at the end of the game, as they say, you can't take it with you. Right. So, or maybe you can, I don't know. I'm not looking forward to finding out either way. The point being is <laughs> that I think our brains as, as entrepreneurs get us in a position where we go, okay, this sounds risky, right? Because it's it's not the norm. We weren't taught that way. We're supposed to go back to banks. I got to keep it all. I got to give up part of this. Yeah. Uh, you know, my, my head just starts swelling with all this stuff. And I think what happens is people just get into fear and mm -hmm. they don't objectively look at this thing in the capacity of how the, the people who are very wealthy look at these type of things. 100% you're spot on. I, I work with a lot of clients and sometimes the clients are like, you know, this, this makes perfect sense, but I have to just worry about today. I have to worry about today's bills. And, you know, it's just like too far to think about. Um, I think that still, I think that I'm a big fan of creating obstacles to counteract your human nature. So I, like you said, we're trained. We, we have, when it comes to our human nature and money, they kind of conflict, right? Like naturally we're not really good with money as humans. We have a lot of, you know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff we have to work on, and I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of putting yourself in a situation where it's kind of already too late almost. Uh, one of the my, one of my favorite ways of saving is a, like a forced saving. If you told me put money you know aside every month, it's mo for me and for most people, it's very hard to do that. And I see it all the time working with clients in these financial anal analysis meetings. It's very hard to be like, okay, yeah, I, I promise I'll save five hundred dollars a month. 
right. n- people won't do it. Right. But now if we set up a payment plan that automatically drafts out of your account on the first of every month, you know, $500 a month, it changes everything. Now the statistics flip. Now it's like 99% of people will do that, you know, right. and somehow, some way you afford it too when you're, when you, when you position it that way. So that's kind of how I, I would, I would position this, right? I would recommend you, you, you read content, read about this co- uh, concept, right? Check out the book, The Bank on Yourself Revolution. Check out the book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Listen to podcasts like this. Listen to our podcast. Listen to podcasts that talk about this strategy called Bank on Yourself or Infinite Banking. Uh, pretty much the use of cash value life insurance. And then once you're, once you feel it, that it's a good idea, then just pull the trigger and, and, and continue with it, right? Like put yourself in a situation where it's kind of already kind of too late. It works. You only need certain, you only need a certain amount of evidence to proceed with anything. You don't need really, if you think about it, if you go back and you look at all the decisions you've made in your life, it wasn't like you had 100% conclusive evidence that that thing was going to work that you proceeded with. Never, it never was, but you had enough to proceed with. So it's a big difference, right? So you understand this concept. You, it, you, it sounds like a good idea. Proceed with it. Put yourself in a situation where it's kind of already like you've gone too far with it now and see the benefits of it. Makes sense. I, I'm not sure if it's Singapore or one of the countries, I think in that area, they actually uh, do force savings. Or yeah. forced investments or something like that yeah. from from their from their folks, um, because I don't think the government wants them on their payroll at the end, right? I, yes, I think yeah. that's my personal bias. Um, yeah, but it's it's interesting when we do things like this and we when we force ourselves to, and you, you don't even have it anymore. It's just like it's like taxes. Yeah. It comes out, boom. You don't you know you're like, oh that that sucks. But yeah. I still you know I got it. I got to pay the taxes, right? Type of thing. Um, but something magical happens when we do things like this. We actually figure out ways to actually overcome and yes. rise up. Uh, so I think that's part of our system to keep people down and, and kind of poor, if you yes. will, yeah. at, the, at the end, uh, yeah. especially. So I, I really appreciate you bringing the subject matter forth. All right. So let's say, you know, people go, all right, this makes a little bit sense. Uh, what was the name of the book, the first book? Bank on Yourself Revolution by Palma Yellen. Okay. So the Bank on Yourself Revolution. I read the book, blah, blah, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Want to talk to Sari now? How do they get a hold of you? Yeah. You can go to thinkinglikeabank.com and you could schedule an appointment. You could check out our podcast. You could download an ebook. You could send me an email. All of that is found at thinkinglikeabank.com. And I'd love to work with you, kind of get to understand your business needs, your wants, your goals, and kind of see how we could position this to get you to the next step. Okay. So that was thinking like a bank.com. Yes. Okay, cool. Sorry. I appreciate you being here on the CEO sales strategies podcast. Uh, thanks for bringing it. Thanks for, for probably making some people go, what the hell is this guy talking about? And, and, and others <laughs> going, my God, that sounds amazing. Uh, or, oh my God, am I going to end up in jail or, you know, <laughs> whatever. But it, it, we yeah. might've created a little controversy on this one, but that's okay. Cause it gets people thinking. And the reality is I know these vehicles have been yeah. around for a long time. So exactly. Um, and I didn't invent this, right. This has been in, this has been going on for over a hundred years. The wealthiest families in this country have been using it. Politicians use this, you know, this, this is not something that's kind of like I made up right now before this podcast is it's a, it's a proven concept. It's a proven <laughs> strategy, you know, uh, and there's a lot of content behind it. Once you, once you find that content, there's a lot of it out there. Right. Well, and if you hadn't made it up prior to this podcast, I wouldn't have had you here anyway. So that's because, <laughs> <laughs> because we don't play that way here. So that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, thanks for being here. Uh, and uh, come on back again. I'd love to have you back again. Folks, reach out to them. Reach out to me. Let, let us know how you, uh, what you're thinking of. And, uh, you know, please don't send me hate mail for the previous comment that I sent on crypto. So <laughs> <laughs> until next time. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Doug. All right. So did you ever think you could be your own banker? I mean, when you really think about it. Now, I never thought about this early on in my life, especially because it was just some one of those things. It felt risky. It was like, wow, my God, you know, and it just was just so out of the normal. But then when I started talking to people who actually had a lot of money and I started hanging around with people with a lot of money and I realized they were using some of these vehicles, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, it's eye opening. So my point being is that if you are looking to grow and if you are uh, looking to fund something, 
Uh, you can either do it from internal funding or external funding. Now, internal funding means, hey, you sell more, right? That's just what it is. Sell more for profit and you internally fund it. External funding is, hey, you go borrow it somewhere. So the question is, when you go borrow it, do you borrow it from yourself or do you borrow it from another entity? That's really what it comes down to. So I hope you got a lot out of this episode. If you like the content of this, uh, let me know. If you don't, let me know. I'd like to know. I want to get the feedback from you. If you have a subject matter of expertise and you want to be on this podcast, let us know. Reach out to you matter, Y-O-U-M-A-T-T-E-R at CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. Or if you know somebody else that has expertise, reach out. We will answer all inquiries and uh, we'll see if it's a fit for the show or not. If so, we'll have you on or have the person that you refer us on. If you love the podcast, please, 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 please go give it a five-star review. And if you're looking for yourself or someone you know who wants to be in that top 1% earners, if you will, those elite producers and through selling, you know, at least making $500,000 a year or up net selling, reach out to me at Doug at CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. I'm sorry, Doug at CEO Sales Strategies uh, com, And you'll know this is live because I just made a mistake. And uh, let me know what you're thinking. Uh, if you're a company looking for elite producers, also let us know that too. We have access to those folks for you. Till next time, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. As always, go out and sell something. Sell something profitably. Play win-win. Help other people out. They win. You win. Makes the world a better place. Everybody's a bit happier. To your success. Thank you for listening to another episode of the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. What is something that you learned that you could act on today? Don't forget to schedule it now or it may never get forward momentum. If you find our content valuable, please leave a favorable review and let us know what you liked. Please also share this with others if the content will help them. For our show notes, other episodes, and more interesting content and resources, please visit CEO Sales Strategies Podcast.com. See you soon and to your continued success.